Holy ho, my horror hounds! Sugar Pants back at it! And Oh, come on, I actually had a great movie I was going to review today. You can't interrupt me when I've already got a movie lined up for the day. Fine, 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 fine. Let the widow baby have her way again. So what do you have for me today? Nineteen ninety eight's The Chosen One Legend of the Raven. And doesn't sound too bad. What's it about? It's a Carmen Electra flick? Oh fuck that, I'm out. I'll watch a fucking Carmen Electra movie. I, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna not do bad things anymore. Why, 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 why does she hurt me like this? <sighs> okay. The Chosen One, Legend of the Raven. Here we go with the sleaze docket. We have seven dead bodies, but two get resurrected. Six cups blood. One cup urine, three gobs of spit, four naked breasts, three naked butts, one sex scene, Star Wars plagiarism, text scroll narration, super bouncy forest jog, subservient breakfast, sexy orgasmic cultural appropriation, plate lickage, kitty cat style self licking, orgasmic writhing resurrection, one milk shower, Leg channeled milk drinking. Milk drenched sexy time. I put it in quotations because it clearly wasn't really milk. Exercise side boob. Orgasmic Native American bondage. Sexy steel pipe beatdown. Ringing phone cock blockery. Apple bite douchebaggery cliche. Radio only broadcast exposition cliche. Gratuitous giant hair. Gratuitous porn metal. Crescent medallion branding. One double beat down. One bullet to the shoulder. Shotgun blasted belly. Shotgun blasted back. Shotgun butt to the head. Two bullets to the gut. One slit throat. Turquoise moonshine. Public urination. Post beat down water sports. Post beat down truck sex. Force Healing, and Big Hair Alley Catfight. Well, what the hell do you want me to say? It's a 90s movie and Carmen Electra has top billing. My best guess is the script was a stack of greasy Denny's placemats with crayon drawings. Basically, it's a softcore porn director's attempt at recreating The Crow. Which is funny, considering I've seen porn stars kneeling to film a 20-minute bukkake video show more emotional range than Carmen Electra. It's dreadfully painful, and there isn't nearly enough skin to be considered a fair trade for sitting through it. So let's get to the dreck. It all starts with a garbage text scroll and narration, and I'm sure someone thought Episode 1, Renewed Hope, was fucking cute. It's a trite and cliché diatribe about good and evil, and tells of a sacred pendant that's the one true weapon in the epic war. Naturally, they have to say it's an epic war, because they sure as hell ain't going to show anything epic over the next 90 minutes. Our movie actually begins with Emma Brave Knight digging in the dirt for the sacred crescent, the source of ultimate power against the forces of evil. And we're barely 30 seconds of actual film footage, and I'm already calling a timeout. First of all, am I brave knight? Seriously? I can't tell if it's a shitty comic book name or a shitty porn name. Second, why did she choose tit-boosting lingerie as her dig-in-the-dirt outfit? And third, that's not a crescent. It's a spiral. <sighs> My god, this review is going to be five hours long, isn't it? Okay, let's keep going. 
Some dip-fuck grease ball shows up to ogle Emma's one-dollar rub-on-shoulder tattoo and to chase her through the woods. Oh, <laughs> well, at least she was smart enough to put on sneakers to complete her ensemble. <laughs> Naturally, she trips over everything in the woods and the grease ball catches up to her, and we get a pathetic title image showing that, yes, it's totally ripping off the crow. McKenna Brave Knight rolls into town because of her sister's death, and the narrator explains that she's been gone for four years. We show a Native American who finds the crescent out in the woods and explains that he will have to give the pendant to his first daughter, McKenna. This gave me a heavy heart. But then we cut back to McKenna, who refers to this man as Poppy, and he sounds nothing like the narrator. Emma is one of us, as you are, and always will be. Why the hell didn't they just keep this guy on to do the voiceovers? Anyway, McKenna says to not start his tribal crap again. And we cut to a ceremony of Emma's ashes being tossed one handful at a time. Malibé, Malibu, Wapa Kuka, Malihe, Dubi, Dubi, Du. We also learn the only sheriff in town has some history with McKenna. I mean, naturally, this town has like a dozen people. But in the B story, we see he's been shacking up with Nora, who's suddenly real curious whether or not Henry has seen McKenna or not. Then we suddenly slam cut into story C, taking place in some skeevy leather bar basement or something, where the local serial killer is making his victim choose which eye gets cut. But we leave before anything fun happens in order to not spend a fucking dime of the budget on gore special effects. Back to McKenna, who's sleeping under the couch cushions? She's disturbed by a slow-motion vision of Emma, and then we go to a native ceremony where she's branded. Sort of. And then we get some of the sexiest cultural appropriation I've ever seen. Henry finds her lying in a ditch or whatever, and takes her back to his place where she's developed the odd habit of licking plates. But it's okay, because she's also horny as fuck, and we get a bump and grind session that's almost worth the previous 27 agonizing minutes of film. And then there's story D, a bunch of dip-fuck rednecks who make turquoise moonshine or whatever. Who cares? Fuck you. So since there's only like six actual characters, Nora starts developing evil powers and kicks the shit out of Henry when he tries to get her off her sudden drinking binge. She gives the king of the redneck dip fucks a ride in the truck and makes Henry watch. But they're nice enough to drop Henry's unconscious body off at home. Using her powers of... love... Jesus Christ... She force heals Henry 21 fucking years before Mary Sue Skywalker does it and with the exact same amount of effort given to acquire the ability. Absolutely zero. She then runs off to confront the rednecks and is immediately shot. He hands Nora a knife and they chase off after her while the narrator tells us Evil's grip had finally closed around the hearts of these lost souls. And because this movie already long ago abandoned the belief that it was written, McKenna actually manages to run all the way to a conveniently pre-dug grave. Nora shoots her, sending her dead body into the hole, but then Captain of the Dipshits shoots Nora right in with her. What a waste of a perfectly good piece of ass. Awesome. Movie's over at the 42 minute mark, right? Nope. Just like the crow, the power of the raven comes from death. Unless you're the other owner of the crescent necklace, in which case death was fucking permanent. Again, not nearly enough skin in this movie to put up with this crapulence. Now that she's resurrected, the narrator tells us all of her wonderful new powers. The power of acute taste, smell, and vision. The power to change her shape and form. The power of perfect strength and grace. 
Ladies and gentlemen, I give you the only fucking time anyone will ever accuse Carmen Electra of having grace. Meanwhile, Nora resurrects thanks to being dead right next to the Crescent. <laughs> Man, that thing is super powerful. Too bad it didn't do a fucking thing to Emma when she was murdered. And I have had enough of this movie, so let's speed up this summation. The serial killer, oh, remember him? You shouldn't, it's been over half an hour since we've seen him. He picks up Nora and she kills him in a by-the-hour hotel somehow and finds his sex dungeon. McKenna gets an elongated dressing montage and we're not supposed to find it gut-wrenchingly hilarious when she shows up for her first fight against evil, represented by a pair of low-level crooks. <laughs> but instead of getting a taste of the mile-long laundry list of new superpowers she's supposed to have, she fucking lands two punches and one kick, and then we cut away. <laughs> awesome. Sure wish this movie would actually be whatever the hell it's supposed to be. It's not enough skin for softcore porn, it's not at all enough action for action, and they're playing it too goddamn serious for me to believe this was meant to be a comedy. It's not ha-ha funny, it's more I held my breath too long because my parents wouldn't get me an Xbox for Christmas and now I think Andrew Tate is the perfect example of masculinity funny. Anyway, after working up a tiny sweat, she comes back home for a shower, sees that Henry is there, and then proceeds to take a milk bath. You know, just like a raven does. And we get yet another ripoff of Salma Hayek's vastly superior leg beverage delivery system. And I still say Salma did it way better fully clothed. We then get an elongated white fluid bath. It's supposed to be milk, but there ain't no way this goopy white swill is any dairy product. Unless it's been sitting behind the radiator all winter long. Nora shows up to take out the rednecks in her baby's first fetish gear, while McKenna does aggressive aerobics. Eventually, the movie just gets tired of mindless filler bullshit, and we finally get a showdown between Nora and McKenna at a cheap dive bar. Hello, scumbag. Henry gets shot, and McKenna gets a knife to the throat. Suddenly, she remembers her power to transform time and space. Jesus fucking Christ. And then we get some clunky fight choreography and over-the-top sound effects to make us think something is actually happening. And the fight ends with Nora getting her throat slashed. The fucking end. This truly is an example of a movie that could only have been made before an internet-ready computer was a major device in all households. What I mean by that is Google is a much less painful option than The Chosen One if all you wanted to see was a naked Carmen Electra. Unfortunately, us 90s kids had to stay up late and sit through 88 minutes of garbage in order to see about 150 seconds of actual naked Carmen. Compare that to right now. Just a fraction of a second on Google and you are inundated with gloriously silent pictures of Carmen. All the skin and none of the speaking. Oh, don't get me wrong. I'm definitely not advocating for women to be naked and silent. I'm just saying silent photos of Carmen are a lot easier on the earballs than practically any audio she's ever recorded. Although, say what you will about her acting, but at least it's better than her short-lived music career. Jesus Christ, Prince, we loved you so much and this is how you repay our love? The Chosen One was directed by Lawrence Lanoff, who also played the serial killer in this one. His career was mostly about titillation, whether it be feature-length movies or videos for Playboy, which makes it such a shame that this movie's skin content is so damn low. I don't mind if a movie ends up being a stinker, but either give me a ton of flesh or a ton of gore to balance out the crap. 
Say what you will about a movie like The Monster at Camp Sunshine, but at least it had the decency to throw in 58 naked breasts and 48 naked butts to make sitting through the non-story somewhat worth it. What the hell are you offering me, Chosen One? There you go. And believe it or not, but two actual people wrote this repugnant pile of rhinoceros plot. Cara Bromley would go on to be one of the writers for The Rowdy Girls, which was a considerable step up from The Chosen One. Go check out my review of that movie to see a skin flick that was done right. Or at least better. Honestly, about the only actor of note for me was Frank Salcedo, who played Poppy for a very short amount of screen time. He also played Ben Whitemoon in the segment Old Chief Woodenhead in Creepshow 2. So with that putrescent picture placed on the pile, it's past the point of proclaiming our parting ways. And until I greet you again for another feculent film, this is your moldy Montebank sugar pants. See you in your dreams. Chosen one. Loving him is lots of fun. We love the chosen one. Not as much as me. I love him with my heart. I love him with my body parts. We love the chosen one. Everybody shush. There, it is decided I love the chosen one most. <laughs> <laughs>